Namaste and good morning, everyone. Let's do some prayers before our class. Om Guru Brahma, Guru Vishnu, Guru Devo, Maheshwara, Guru Sakshat Parbrahma, Tasme Shri Guru Venamaha, Om Bhur Bhavaswa, Tatsavitra Varenayam, Pargo Deva Siddhi Mahim, Dio Yonaha Prachodayar, Astoma Sadgamya, Tamsoma Jyotirgamya, Mrityorma Amritam Gamya, Om Sainavavatu, Sainabhunatu, Saviryam Karvavahe, Tejasvi Navadhi Tamastu, Ma Vidveshavahe, Om Shanti Shanti Shanti. Let's do the peace invocation, which is in front of this uh, Upanishad also. Uh, the Upanishad which we are studying these days is uh, a three Upanishad. Om Vang me manasihi pratishtha, mana me vachi pratishtham avir avir me edi, vedasse me anistaha shrutam me ma prahasi, anen aditen aho ratran sandhami, ritam vadishyami satyam vadishyami, tat maam avatu tat vaktaram avatu. Avtu maam, avtu vaktaram, avtu vaktaram. Om shanti, shanti, shanti. Okay, let's open our books. We are on the second chapter now. In section one. And this is the very first verse over here. Purushe have ayam adita garbha bhavati yat etat reta tat etat sarvebhya anghebhya teja sambhutam atmani evatmanam vibhati tat jada istriyam sinjati at etat janyati tat asse pratmam janam. Purushe in the man have verily ayam this. Adita at first, Garbha embryo, Bhavati becomes. Yat means which, Etat this is, Retaha seed, the sperm. Tat that, Etat this, Sarvebhya from all, Angebhya from parts, Tejaha. The vigor. Sambhutam is accomplished as essence. Atmani in the self. Ev means indeed Atmanam the self. Virbhati bears. That means that Yadda when Striyam into a womb, Sinjati pours. Ath then, etat this, janyati, makes it born. Tat that, asse his, prathmam, first, janam, birth. In a man, verily, this one becomes at first, that seed, which is called, germ, which is called the seed. That which is a semen is the essence of strength and vigor. Drawn from all his limbs. In the self, indeed, one bears the self. When he pours this into a womb, he causes it to be born. This is its first birth. So in this section, we have a detailed description of the various stages which take place before the baby is born. So in our Vedic philosophy, we have the explanation of the oneness of the universe, but also a rigid scheme of arguments and observations where we realize the connection between each other also. Connection between the parents with the children. 
connection between the husband and wife. So in this chapter, we see the process of procreation, which is fully analyzed. But we are viewing this from the standpoint of a philosophy. Because biologically, we know how the sperm deposited in the womb grows itself to be the fetus. And its maturity gets emerged out as a child. But here the same process is viewed from a divine and subtly philosophical standpoint. So this Rishi is trying to indicate the entire picture of the essential oneness of the father with the son. And son over here doesn't mean only a male. It could be it is son as well as a daughter. So offspring. If we can realize it, remember it, the unit of a society, which is home, will be properly organized well. If each household is organized like that, then community, the society, the nation, they will organize by themselves. That's what these Vedic rishis are telling us. So it's like a more equitable sense of mutual understanding and with a deeper sense of mutual love and the union. So in this very opening <clears throat> section, or opening verse of this section, very dramatically, the Guru is requesting the pregnant women who are there to retire for some time. Apkramantu garbhinya. That means the pregnant women may please vacate for some time. And we'll see that he will call them into that lecture hall again at the end of this section. So he will say that you can re-enter this hall of study. This Upanishad is uh, an integral part of Vedas. So this is a definite proof to show that Hindu women used to have in those days free access to the great teachers and a very welcome admission into their discourses. It's not just only for the male segment of the society. But all women who are pregnant, they are requested to go leave the hall, there is a psychological reason behind it. Psychology was very well developed in the days of the Vedas. And the teachers, they made use of their knowledge of the human mind at every moment in all their contacts with their disciples in particular and in society in general also. These rishis consistently put into practice the knowledge of their psychology for preparing healthier social life. They understood the connection between the body and the mind. And over here, they are trying to avoid all the strains and stresses upon the mental personalities of these pregnant women. We all know that food which a mother takes, it assimilates, goes into the production of the body and the form of the child in her womb. We know that. That's why these days we say, eat healthy food. But Rishis, they knew not just the food for the physical body, but the 
thoughts in the mind, the words which mother hears during the pregnancy give a direction and an impetus to psychological makeup of the child. This section explains the various stages in which the child grows from the moment of the insemination. So the Rishi felt that perhaps the pregnant mothers would come to entertain the sexual thoughts and they might harm and destroy the mental life of the child because the child is yet to be born. So that's why the instruction, pregnant women, please retire. So in this mantra, when he says that this one becomes at first the germ or the seed, this one, I am, that means the supreme conditioned by the individual's vasanas. So that's like a jivatma. So it's like an entire past life in thought and action. This entity is called Jeev. Jeev. It is moving about, demanding and expecting a fit vehicle to gain for itself a complete fulfillment of all its desires. We are all born because we had certain desires. And through this vehicle, we can fulfill the desires. So this one, first of all, manifests itself as potent sperm in an individual. This is, he's trying to make us understand. I am. We got to just remember that how Rare, we get a chance to become a human being, to have the vehicle of a human being. I am. That reproductive fluid is the essence of the assimilated food, is not a modern biological discovery. It is a very old information that was available even in the Vedic period. That's what's indicated here in this verse. When the mantra says that the seminal fluid is the essence of strength and vigor drawn from all his limbs. So like the whole unit. So every seed in man is the essence of that individual. And as such, philosophically, we may say that one lives as the seed in oneself. So in this sense, the mantra declares an obvious philosophical truth when it says, in the self, indeed, one bears the self. So the seed is nothing but a miniature of oneself. When it is poured into the reproductory system, there is an emergence of the man out of himself. In this sense, we may say that the first birth of that individual being is when, as a seed, it emerges out. And it's delivered into the womb. Ordinarily, we call it a birth when the child is thrown out from the womb into a field where that newborn, as we call it, can find a favorable atmosphere to continue its growth and expression in the outer world. But when this individual in the form of a seed is placed in the womb, it being the right world where the sperm can find a conducive atmosphere to grow into a more developed 
expressiveness. So he's calling that as a first birth. So philosophically, we may say that he is born again when the individual throws his seed into the womb of his partner. So continuation from the father to the child. And then he says, Tat istriyaha atam bhutam gachati yatha swam angam tatha tasmat enam nahinasati Sa asya etam atmanam atragatam bhavyati. This is verse number two of this section. That means that. That means that seed. Istriya with the woman. Atam bhutam of her own. Gachati becomes. Yatha means as. Swam means once. Angam ling. Lim, ang, tatha means like that. Tasmat, therefore, enam, to this. To this means the mother, that woman. No means not, hinasati, hurt, or injure. Sa means she, that, that woman, asse. His, over here, his means her husband. Etam, this, so this means this seed. Atmanam, self. Atra gatam, having come to her. Atra gatam, to means her body. Bhavyati nourishes. That seed becomes one with a woman. So that sperm becomes one with the mother. Just as a limb of her own. Therefore, the fetus does not injure her. There is no harm. She nourishes this self. This self of her husband that has thus come to her. Very intimately it is being explained here. Because something which is your own will not hurt you. So that seed becomes, that sperm becomes hers also. First it was that man's. Now it is a part of the woman. So the seed that has reached the womb becomes a part of the mother as intimately connected with her as her various internal organs. Like her heart or the liver. Since the seed has become the part and parcel of her, she is unconscious of its presence in her. And it does not give her any particular agony. In time it grows and all along she with the food assimilated by her nourishes the essence of her husband that has reached its present field of development in her womb. As mothers we can understand this. We have all experienced it. Verse number three, continuation of this. Sa bhavitrihi bhavit veha bhavati tam istri garbham vibharti sa agre ev kumaram janmana agre adhi bhavyati sa yat kumaram janmana agre adhi bhavyati atmanam ev tat bhavyati esham loka naam santaya evam santataha hi ime lokaha tat asse dvitviyam janma See, yesterday we were talking about mantras. They are different than the shloka. So Vedas are written in a mantra form. Sometimes there are two lines, sometimes three lines, sometimes four lines, sometimes five lines. As many lines as they wanted to write. 
to convey the message beautifully. Sa means she, the mother. Bhavyatri, nourisher. So she is the nourisher of that fetus now. Bhavyatvaha, fit to well nourish. Bhavati becomes tam, him, that is her husband. Istri, woman. Garbham, an embryo in the womb. Be bhartihi bears. Sir means he, father, a grey before, Eva itself, Kumaram, child, Janmana, birth, a grey before, adhi, after. That means after birth. Bhavyati nourishes. Sir means he, father, yat, which, Kumaram, child, Janmana, birth, a grey before. Adhi bhavyati nourishes Atmanam himself. Ev means alone. Tat means that. Bhavyati nourishes a sham of these. Loka nam of worlds. Santya for the continuation. Like a santati continuation. Evam das santata continued. He means verily. Ime dos lokaha worlds. That means that asse his. That means his like a father. Dvitiyam second janam birth. Since she the mother becomes the nourisher of his, her husband's self within her. She also becomes fit to be well nourished. Because the nourishment is going from the mother to the fetus. So mother, if mother eats well, the fetus in the womb gets well fed. So since she becomes the nourisher of his self within her, she also becomes fit to be well nourished. The woman bears him, her husband, as an embryo in her womb. First it was a seed, then it becomes an embryo. He, the father, nourishes the child before and after its birth. So that is the duty of the father. In that he nourishes the child from its birth onwards. He but nourishes his own self. So that means uh, nourishing the child but actually nourishing himself because there is a union. There is no difference uh, between these two. For the continuation of these worlds. See, that's how the worlds keep on going. We keep on, we were helped and we are going to help. Thus are these worlds continued. This is his second birth. Second birth of the father also. That's how we can look at it. So the mother nourishes the child not only physically but also mentally. Remember that. As we have already seen with her assimilated food and with the quality of her constant thoughts. The child in the womb is nothing other than its father's own essence. He has got to feel in fact a great debt of gratitude to his wife who is providing for himself and that baby, that fetus to grow and express in due time as his own son. She nourishes the child in her womb and she 
should be nourished well also. So here we are told that this is the sacred basis upon which the sanctity of marriage is to be recognized by all of us. To the Hindus, marriage is a sacramental tie. Under the roof of love, And it's tied in the presence of truth and divinity. This relationship is not a contract. As we normally see these days. Our Vedic seers. They said this relationship ultimately you become one. So over here, the loving advice is that a householder should nourish the mother of his son because she nourishes his son in her home. It is the father's moral duty to feed the child and to nourish it. So not only during the prenatal condition, but also afterwards. And again, remember the word nourish is used in the largest sense of the term which includes not only the physical nourishment, but also the mental and the intellectual development of the child. Only then the whole personality is being well nourished. So the father has a great duty to cater to the bodily development of the child, also to provide him with the enough chances to grow mentally and intellectually. So in thus nourishing the child, he is actually nourishing himself. This is what this Rishi is trying to point out to us. Because the child is not anyone different himself. It's a continuation. That's why as parents, we don't feel that it's a burden to take care of our children when we have to tend them, when we have to take care of them, whether it's physically or mentally, emotionally, because any harm happen to any parts of our limbs, we suffer ourselves. So it's like a feeling of oneness. So the attempt of the master, the Rishi, is to make the father realize his oneness, at least with his own son. Then later on, you can take this to another level. Feel the oneness, because we all breathe the same air, drink the same water, eat the same food. There's a oneness. And when we recognize that we are the Atma, then definitely there's a oneness. So there are not two Atmas, there's only one. But it really starts from home, the oneness. So the intimate relationship between the father and the son is a very healthy and useful training for an ordinary householder preparing to grow to a greater heights and to come to feel the oneness that is in this pluralistic phenomena. The problem is that we just become so attached and we just stay only with our own offsprings. By doing these duties afterwards, you got to expand the horizon, that oneness with everybody. So that sperm grown by now into a fully developed fetus is now born into the outer world as a child and becomes his second birth. And again, I would like to emphasize this child can be either a son or a daughter. There is no overemphasis in the Vedas of any kind special recognition of divinity in man. Okay. The same ansh of that anshi is in the female also and the male also. There's no special ansh in 
a male body. So father is the seed himself, not only in his son, but also in his daughter. Since the form of a seed was first born into the womb and from there the same grew and its own fullness. Emerged out as a child, his own child. So child is only the second stage in the development of the father himself. That's why when we become parents, we really learn about ourselves more. We learn how to sacrifice, how to bring the other person ahead of our own needs because it's an extension of us. But again, remember, we got to do it, not just our own biological children, if you really want to grow the way our the Vedic seers wanted us to grow, we got to have feel the sameness with everybody. Okay. Let's do one more. Sa asse ayam atma punyebhya karma bhya prati dhiyate ath asse ayam itra atma krit kritya vyogataha prati sa ita prayan eva punha jayate tat asse tritiyam Janama. Sa means he, the son. Asse of his, that means the father's. I am this, Atma self, Unnebhya, for good. Karmabhya, duties, Prati Dhyate, is initiated. At means then, Asse this, Son, I am this, that means father, itra, other, atma, self. Krit kritiyaha, that is a sense of inward satisfaction, like a fulfillment, krit kritya. Vyogataha, having reached ripe old age, prayati departs. Sa means he, itaha, from here. Prayan, having departed, ev alone, punha again, jayate is born. That means that asya his titiyam, third, janam, birth. That son, who is the father's own self, is put in the father's place, for the performance of the pious deeds. Then this other self of the boy, the father, having done its duties, having reached a ripe old age, dies away. After the death indeed, he is born again. This is his third birth. So like a continuation of this life. So when the child who had been nourished by the father during its prenatal natal and postnatal existence comes to his right age, well educated, obedient, healthy, the boy is initiated into the duties of the home. And he becomes a true substitute for the father. He holds the reins of the family then. And the import of this mantra, we can say that the father, after educating the child, retires himself from his life's activities, substituting the son in his particular walk of life. It's almost like a father is a doctor, And if a son has also become a doctor, he gives his practice to his son. Or a businessman can hand over his business to his son. So in the healthier days of Vedic period, the generations always panted for a chance to retire from the grosser activities. Even the kings 
at a proper time retired and gave the kingdom to the son. So a healthy father having reared up his children when he comes of his old age and retires and gives the reign to the oldest child. And old father in the ripeness of his age smiling in a glaring sense of inward satisfaction. Krit kretata. I have done well. I feel fulfilled. Quietly departs. No attachment. Surrounded by his family and society, he leaves the body. And the departed jiva, because it's not uh, mukt yet, uh, still it's a jivatma, again seeks his identity with another suitable form in a fitting external atmosphere. And this birth of the departed father again in the world is called the third birth. So this way we have taken many, many births. Father can be considered as representing the last generation, the son as the present generation, and the third birth of the father representing the future generation. So the oneness of all the chiefs, the past, present, and future is indicated here. There's a continuation. There's a union. So the oneness of not only a father and a son, but by saying this, the teacher is definitely pointing out the code of oneness on which the past, present, and the future is stronger. It does not exclude the other layers of life represented by animal and vegetable kingdom either. The ground is common for the entire living world that procreates, belonging to all the three periods of time. That's what's indicated here in this mantra. So from this description, a hasty student might understand that the Vedic literature is giving an undue importance to physical structure or the reproductory methods. Also, the processes of death and birth. We'll see that in the following mantra. This little doubt is removed. We'll see the clue that even though the birth and death are only with reference to the body, but the essence is the soul. Because the soul is the theme of these scriptures. And that alone is the concern of the rishis. But since we live in this world, we are more familiar with the body. We are familiar with this relationships and our children. So he's just in a very delicate manner bringing out the whole philosophy in front of us. So that means this Upanishadic philosophy is for us also, not just only for the renunciates, for the sadhus, for us householders also. We can do the sadhana while doing our duties, taking care of this body, not getting attached to the body, Taking care of our children, not getting attached to them. And we'll see how beautifully he is explaining in the next couple of verses next week. So let's stop it here. Om Purnamada Purnamidam Purnat Purnamudachate Purnase Purnamadai Purnam Eva Visheshate Om Shanti 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 Thank you very much.